Chapter One of Specimen Days. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Specimen Days by Walt Whitman. Chapter One. A happy hour's command. Down in the woods, July second, eighteen eighty two. If I do it at all, I must delay no longer. Incongruous and full of skips and jumps, as is that huddle of diary jottings, war memoranda of eighteen sixty two, sixty five, nature notes of eighteen seventy seven, eighty one, with Western and Canadian observations afterwards all bundled up and tied by a big string. The resolution, and indeed mandate, comes to me this day, this hour. And what a day, what an hour just passing! The luxury of riant grass and blowing breeze, with all the shows of sun and sky and perfect temperature, never before so filling me, body and soul. To go home, untie the bundle, reel out diary scraps and memoranda just as they are, large or small, one after another, into print pages, and let the melanges, lackings, and wants of connection take care of themselves. It will illustrate one phase of humanity anyhow, how few of life's days and hours, and they not by relative value or proportion, but by chance, are ever noted. Probably another point, too, how we give long preparations for some object, planning and delving and fashioning, and then, when the actual hour for doing arrives, find ourselves still quite unprepared, and tumble the thing together, letting hurry and crudeness tell the story better than fine work. At any rate, I obey my happy hour's command, which seems curiously imperative. Maybe, if I don't do anything else, I shall send out the most wayward, spontaneous, fragmentary book ever printed. Footnote number one. The pages from one to fifteen are nearly verbatim an offhand letter of mine in January 1882 to an insisting friend. Following, I give some gloomy experiences. The war of attempted secession has of course, been the distinguishing event of my time. I commenced at the close of 1862 and continued steadily through 63, 64, and 65 to visit the sick and wounded of the Army, both on the field and in the hospitals in and around Washington City. From the first I kept little notebooks for impromptu jottings in pencil to refresh my memory of names and circumstances and what was specially wanted, etc. In these I briefed cases, persons, sights, occurrences in camp, by the bedside, and not seldom by the corpses of the dead. Some were scratched down from narratives I heard and itemized while watching, or waiting, or tending somebody amid those scenes. I have dozens of such little notebooks left, forming a special history of those years, for myself alone, full of associations never to be possibly said or sung. I wish I could convey to the reader the associations that attach to these soiled and creased livres, each composed of a sheet or two of paper, folded small to carry in the pocket, and fastened with a pin. I leave them just as I threw them by after the war, blotched here and there with more than one blood stain hurriedly written, sometimes at the clinic, not seldom amid the excitement of uncertainty, or defeat, or of action, or getting ready for it, or a march. Most of the pages from twenty to seventy-five are verbatim copies of those lurid and blood-smutched little notebooks. Very different are most of the memoranda that follow. Sometime after the war ended I had a paralytic stroke, which prostrated me for several years. In 1876 I began to get over the worst of it. From this date, portions of several seasons, especially summers, I spent at a secluded haunt down in Camden County, New Jersey. Timber Creek, quite a little river, 
it enters from the great Delaware twelve miles away, with primitive solitudes, winding stream, recluse and woody banks, sweet feeding springs, and all the charms that birds, grass, wild flowers, rabbits and squirrels, old oaks, walnut trees, etc., can bring. Through these times and on these spots, the diary from page 76 onward was mostly written. The collect, afterwards, gathers up the odds and ends of whatever pieces I can now lay hands on, written at various times past, and swoops all together like fish in a net. I suppose I publish and leave the whole gathering first from that eternal tendency to perpetuate and preserve which is behind all nature, authors included. Second, to symbolize two or three specimen interiors, personal and other, out of the myriads of my time, the middle range of the nineteenth century in the new world, a strange, unloosened, wondrous time. But the book is probably without any definite purpose that can be told in a statement. End of footnote. Answer to an insisting friend. You ask for items, details of my early life, of genealogy and parentage, particularly of the women of my ancestry and of its far-back Netherlands stock on the maternal side, of the region where I was born and raised and my mother and father before me, and theirs before them, with a word about Brooklyn and New York cities, the times I lived there as lad and young man. You say you want to get at these details mainly as the go-befores and embryons of leaves of grass. Very good. You shall have at least some specimens of them all. I have often thought of the meaning of such things, that one can only encompass and complete matters of that kind by exploring behind, perhaps very far behind, themselves directly and so into their genesis, antecedents, and cumulative stages. Then, as luck would have it, I lately whiled away the tedium of a week's half-sickness and confinement by collating these very items for another, yet unfulfilled, probably abandoned, purpose. And if you will be satisfied with them, authentic in date occurrence and facts simply, and told my own way, garrulous-like, here they are. I shall not hesitate to make extracts, for I catch at anything to save labor, but those will be the best versions of what I want to convey. Genealogy, Van Velser and Whitman The latter years of the last century found the Van Velser family, my mother's side, living on their own farm at Cold Spring, Long Island, New York State, near the eastern edge of Queens County, about a mile from the harbor. Footnote number two. Long Island was settled first on the west end by the Dutch from Holland, then on the east end by the English, the dividing line of the two nationalities being a little west of Huntington, where my father's folks lived, and where I was born. End of footnote number two. My father's side, probably the fifth generation from the first English arrivals in New England, were at the same time farmers on their own land, and a fine domain it was, five hundred acres, all good soil, gently sloping east and south about one-tenth woods, plenty of grand old trees, two or three miles off at West Hills, Suffolk County. The Whitman name in the eastern states and so branch and south starts undoubtedly from one John Whitman, born 1602 in Old England, where he grew up, married, and his eldest son was born in 1629. He came over in the True Love in 1640 to America and lived in Weymouth, Massachusetts, which place became the mother hive of the New Englanders of the name. He died in 1692. His brother, Reverend Zachariah Whitman, also came over in the True Love, either at that time or soon after, and lived at Milford, Connecticut. A son of this Zachariah, named Joseph, migrated to Huntington, Long Island, and permanently settled there. Savage's Genealogical Dictionary, Volume 4, page 524, gets the Whitman family established at Huntington, per this Joseph, before 1664. It is quite certain that from that beginning, and from Joseph, 
the West Hill, Whitman's, and all others in Suffolk County have since radiated, myself among the number. John and Zachariah both went to England and back again diverse times. They had large families, and several of their children were born in the old country. We hear of the father of John and Zachariah, Abijah Whitman, who goes over into the 1500s, but we know little about him, except that he also was for some time in America. These old pedigree reminiscences come up to me vividly from a visit I made not long since in my 63rd year to West Hills and to the burial grounds of my ancestry, both sides. I extract from notes of that visit written there and then. THE OLD WHITMAN AND VAN VELSER CEMETERIES July 29, 1881 After more than forty years' absence, except a brief visit to take my father there once more two years before he died, went down Long Island on a week's jaunt to the place where I was born, thirty miles from New York City, rode around the old familiar spots, viewing and pondering and dwelling long upon them, everything coming back to me. Went to the old Whitman homestead on the upland and took a view eastward, inclining south, over the broad and beautiful farmlands of my grandfather, 1780, and my father. There was the new house, 1810, the big oak 150 or 200 years old, there the well, the sloping kitchen garden, and a little way off even the well-kept remains of the dwelling of my great-grandfather, 1750-60, still standing with its mighty timbers and low ceilings. Nearby, a stately grove of tall, vigorous black walnuts, beautiful, Apollo-like, the sons, or grandsons, no doubt, of black walnuts during or before 1776. On the other side of the road spread the famous apple orchard, over twenty acres, the trees planted by hands long moldering in the grave, my Uncle Jesse's, but quite many of them evidently capable of throwing out their annual blossoms and fruit yet. I now write these lines seated on an old grave, doubtless of a century since at least, on the burial hill of the Whitmans of many generations. Fifty or more graves are quite plainly traceable, and as many more decayed out of all form, depressed mounds, crumbled and broken stones covered with moss, the gray and sterile hill, the clumps of chestnuts outside, the silence just varied by the soughing wind. There is always the deepest eloquence of sermon or poem in any of these ancient graveyards, of which Long Island has so many. So what must this one have been to me? My whole family history, with its succession of links, from the first settlement down to date, told here, three centuries concentrate on this sterile acre. The next day, July 30th, I devoted to the maternal locality, and if possible was still more penetrated and impressed. I write this paragraph on the burial hill of the Van Velsers, near Cold Spring, the most significant depository of the dead that could be imagined, without the slightest help from art, but far ahead of it, soil sterile, a mostly bare plateau, flat, of half an acre, the top of a hill, brush and well-grown trees and dense woods bordering all around. Very primitive, secluded, no visitors, no road. You cannot drive here, you have to bring the dead on foot, and follow on foot. Two or three score graves quite plain, as many more almost rubbed out. My grandfather Cornelius and my grandmother Amy, Naomi, and numerous relatives nearer or remoter on my mother's side lie buried here. The scene as I stood or sat, the delicate and wild odor of the woods, a slightly drizzling rain, the emotional atmosphere of the place, and the inferred reminiscences were fitting accompaniments. THE MATERNAL HOMESTEAD I went down from this ancient grave place eighty or ninety rods to the site of the Van Velser homestead, where my mother was born, 1795, and where every spot had been familiar to me as a child and youth, 1825-40. Then stood there a long, rambling, dark gray, shingle-sided house, 
with sheds, pens, a great barn, and much open road space. Now of all of those, not a vestige left. All had been pulled down, erased, and the plow and harrow passed over foundations, road spaces, and everything for many summers. Fenced in at present, and grain and clover growing like any other fine fields, only a big hole from the cellar, with some little heaps of broken stone, green with grass and weeds, identified the place. Even the copious old brook and spring seemed to have mostly dwindled away. The whole scene, with what it aroused, memories of my young days there half a century ago, the vast kitchen and ample fireplace, and the sitting-room adjoining, the plain furniture, the meals, the house full of merry people, my grandmother Amy's sweet old face in its Quaker cap, my grandfather the major, jovial, red, stout, with sonorous voice and characteristic physiognomy, with the actual sights themselves made the most pronounced half-day's experience of my whole jaunt. For there, with all those wooded, hilly, healthy surroundings, my dearest mother, Louisa Van Velser, grew up, her mother, Amy Williams, of the Friends or Quakers denomination, the Williams family, seven sisters and one brother, the father and brother sailors, both of whom met their deaths at sea. The Van Velser people were noted for fine horses, which the men bred and trained from blooded stock. My mother, as a young woman, was a daily and daring rider. As to the head of the family himself, the old race of the Netherlands, so deeply grafted on Manhattan Island and in Kings and Queens counties, never yielded a more marked and full Americanized specimen than Major Cornelius Van Velser. Two Old Family Interiors Of the domestic and inside life of the middle of Long Island, at and just before that time, here are two examples. Quote, the Whitmans, at the beginning of the present century, lived in a long story-and-a-half farmhouse, hugely timbered, which is still standing. A great smoke-canopied kitchen, with vast hearth and chimney, formed one end of the house. The existence of slavery in New York at that time, and the possession by the family of some twelve or fifteen slaves, house and field servants, gave things quite a patriarchal look. The very young darkies could be seen, a swarm of them, toward sundown, in this kitchen, squatted in a circle on the floor, eating their supper of Indian pudding and milk. In the house, and in food and furniture, all was rude, but substantial. No carpets or stoves were known, and no coffee, and tea or sugar only for the women. Rousing wood fires gave both warmth and light on winter nights. Pork, poultry, beef, and all the ordinary vegetables and grains were plentiful. Cider was the men's common drink, and used at meals. The clothes were mainly homespun. Journeys were made by both men and women on horseback. Both sexes labored with their own hands, the men on the farm, the women in the house and around it. Books were scarce. The annual copy of the almanac was a treat, and was poured over through the long winter evenings. I must not forget to mention that both these families were near enough to the sea to behold it from the high places, and to hear in still hours the roar of the surf, the latter after a storm giving a peculiar sound at night. Then all hands, male and female, went down frequently on beach and bathing parties, and the men on practical expeditions for cutting salt hay and for clamming and fishing. End of quote. John Burroughs Notes quote, The ancestors of Walt Whitman on both the paternal and maternal sides kept a good table, sustained the hospitalities, decorums, and an excellent social reputation in the county, and they were often of marked individuality. If space permitted, I should consider some of the men worthy special description, and still more some of the women. His great-grandmother, on the paternal side, for instance, was a large, swarthy woman who lived to a very old age. She smoked tobacco, rode on horseback like a man, managed the most vicious horse, and, becoming a widow in later life, went forth every day over her farmlands, 
frequently in the saddle, directing the labor of her slaves, in language in which, on exciting occasions, oaths were not spared. The two immediate grandmothers were in the best sense superior women. The maternal one, Amy Williams before marriage, was a friend, or Quakeress, of sweet sensible character, housewifely proclivities, and deeply intuitive and spiritual. The other, Hannah Brush, was an equally noble, perhaps stronger character, lived to be very old, had quite a family of sons, was a natural lady, was in early life a schoolmistress, and had great solidity of mind. W. W. himself makes much of the women of his ancestry. End of quote. The same. Out from these areas of persons and scenes, I was born May 31st, 1819. And now, to dwell a while on the locality itself, as the successive growth stages of my infancy, childhood, youth, and manhood were all passed on Long Island, which I sometimes feel as if I had incorporated. I roamed as boy and man, and have lived in nearly all parts from Brooklyn to Montauk Point. Pominock and my life on it as child and young man. Footnote number three. Quote, Pominock, P-A-U-M-A-N-O-K, or Pominock, P-A-U-M-A-N-A-K-E, or Pominock, P-A-U-M-A-N-A-C-K, the Indian name of Long Island, over a hundred miles long, shaped like a fish, Plenty of seashore, sandy, stormy, uninviting, the horizon boundless, the air too strong for invalids, the bays a wonderful resort for aquatic birds, the south side meadows covered with salt hay, the soil of the island generally tough but good for the locust tree, the apple orchard, and the blackberry, and with numberless springs of the sweetest water in the world. Years ago, among the baymen, a strong wild race, now extinct, or rather entirely changed, a native of Long Island was called a Pominocker, or Creole Pominocker. End quote. John Burroughs. End of footnote number three. Worth fully and particularly investigating, indeed, this Pominock, to give the spot its aboriginal name, stretching east through Kings, Queens, and Suffolk counties, a hundred and twenty miles altogether, on the North Long Island Sound, a beautiful, varied, and picturesque series of inlets, necks, and sea-like expansions for a hundred miles to Orient Point. On the ocean side, the Great South Bay, dotted with countless hummocks, mostly small, some quite large, occasionally long bars of sand out two hundred rods to a mile and a half from the shore, while now and then, as at Rockaway and far east along the Hamptons, the beach makes right on the island, the sea dashing up without intervention. Several lighthouses on the shores east, a long history of wrecks, tragedies, some even of late years. As a youngster I was in the atmosphere and traditions of many of these wrecks, of one or two almost an observer. Off Hempstead Beach, for example, was the loss of the ship Mexico in 1840, alluded to in The Sleepers in L of g and at hampton some years later the destruction of the brig elizabeth a fearful affair in one of the worst winter gales where margaret fuller went down with her husband and child inside the outer bars or beach this south bay is everywhere comparatively shallow of cold winters all thick ice on the surface as a boy i often went forth with a chum or two on these frozen fields with hand sled axe, and eel spear, after messes of eels. We would cut holes in the ice, sometimes striking quite an eel bonanza, and filling our baskets with great, fat, sweet, white-meated fellows. The scenes, the ice, drawing the hand sled, cutting holes, spearing the eels, etc., were, of course, just such fun as is dearest to boyhood. The shores of this bay, winter and summer, and my doings there in early life, are woven all through L of G. One sport I was very fond of was to go on a bay party in summer to gather seagulls' eggs. The gulls lay two or three eggs 
more than half the size of hen's eggs right on the sand and leave the sun's heat to hatch them the eastern end of long island the peconic bay region i knew quite well too sailed more than once around shelter island and down to montauk spent many an hour on turtle hill by the old lighthouse on the extreme point looking out over the ceaseless roll of the atlantic i used to like to go down there and fraternize with the blue fishers or the annual squads of sea bass takers sometimes along montauk peninsula it is some fifteen miles long and good grazing met the strange unkept half barbarous herdsmen at that time living there entirely aloof from society or civilization in charge on those rich pasturages of vast droves of horses kine or sheep owned by farmers of the eastern towns sometimes too the few remaining indians or half-breeds at that period left on montauk peninsula but now i believe altogether extinct more in the middle of the island were the spreading hempstead plains then eighteen thirty eighteen forty quite prairie-like open uninhabited rather sterile covered with kill calf and huckleberry bushes yet plenty of fair pasture for the cattle mostly milch cows who fed there by hundreds even thousands and at evening the plains too were owned by the towns and this was the use of them in common might be seen taking their way home branching off regularly in the right places i have often been out on the edges of these plains towards sundown and can yet recall in fancy the interminable cow processions and hear the music of the tin or copper bells clanking far or near and breathe the cool of the sweet and slightly aromatic evening air and note the sunset through the same region of the island but further east extended wide central tracts of pine and scrub oak charcoal was largely made here monotonous and sterile but many a good day or half-day did i have wandering through these solitary crossroads inhaling the peculiar and wild aroma here and all along the islands and its shores i spent intervals many years all seasons sometimes riding sometimes boating but generally afoot i was always then a good walker absorbing fields shores marine incidents characters the baymen farmers pilots always had a plentiful acquaintance with the latter and with fishermen went every summer on sailing trips always liked the bare sea beach south side and have some of my happiest hours on it to this day as i write the whole experience comes back to me after the lapse of forty and more years the soothing rustle of the waves and the sawling smell boyhood's times the clam digging barefoot and with trousers rolled up hauling down the creek the perfume of the sedge meadows the hay boat and the chowder and fishing excursions or of later years little voyages down and out new york bay in the pilot boats those same later years also while living in brooklyn eighteen thirty six eighteen fifty i went regularly every week in the mild seasons down to coney island at that time a long bare unfrequented shore which i had all to myself and where i loved after bathing to race up and down the hard sand and to claim homer or shakespeare to the surf and seagulls by the hour but i'm getting ahead too rapidly and must keep more in my traces my first reading lafayette from eighteen twenty four to twenty eight our family lived in brooklyn in front cranberry and johnson streets in the latter my father built a nice house for a home and afterwards another in Tillery Street. We occupied them, one after the other, but they were mortgaged, and we lost them. I yet remember Lafayette's visit. Footnote number four. Quote, On the visit of General Lafayette to this country in 1824, he came over to Brooklyn in state and rode through the city. The children of the schools turned out to join in the welcome an edifice for a free public library for youths was just then commencing, and Lafayette consented to stop on his way and lay the cornerstone. Numerous children arriving on the ground where a huge irregular excavation for the building was already dug, surrounded with heaps of rough stone, 
several gentlemen assisted in lifting the children to safe or convenient spots to see the ceremony. Among the rest, Lafayette, also helping the children, took up the five-year-old Walt Whitman, and, pressing the child a moment to his breast, and giving him a kiss, handed him down to a safe spot in the excavation. End quote. John Burroughs. End of footnote. Most of these years I went to the public schools. It must have been about 1829 or 1830 that I went with my father and mother to hear Elias Hicks preach in a ballroom on Brooklyn Heights. At about the same time employed as a boy in an office, lawyers, father and two sons, Clarks, Fulton Street, near Orange. I had a nice desk and window nook to myself. Edward C. kindly helped me at my handwriting and composition, and, the signal event of my life up to that time, subscribed for me to a big circulating library. For a time I now reveled in romance, reading of all kinds, first the Arabian Nights, all the volumes, an amazing treat, then, with sorties in very many other directions, took in Walter Scott's novels, one after another, and his poetry, and continued to enjoy novels and poetry to this day. Printing Office, Old Brooklyn. After about two years went to work in a weekly newspaper and printing office to learn the trade. The paper was the Long Island Patriot, owned by S. E. Clements, who was also postmaster. An old printer in the office, William Hartshorn, a revolutionary character, who had seen Washington, was a special friend of mine, and I had many a talk with him about long past times. The apprentices, including myself, boarded with his granddaughter. I used occasionally to go out riding with the boss, who was very kind to us boys. Sundays he took us all to a great, old, rough, fortress-looking stone church on Geralaman Street, near where the Brooklyn City Hall now is, at that time broad fields and country roads everywhere around. Afterward I worked on the Long Island Star, Alden Spooner's paper, my father all these years pursuing his trade as carpenter and builder, with varying fortune. There was a growing family of children, eight of us, my brother Jesse, the oldest, myself the second, my dear sisters Mary and Hannah Louisa, my brothers Andrew, George, Thomas, Jefferson, and then my youngest brother Edward, born 1835, and always badly crippled, as I am myself of late years. Footnote number five. Of the Brooklyn of that time, 1830-1840, hardly anything remains except the lines of the old streets. The population was then between ten and 12,000. For a mile, Fulton Street was lined with magnificent elm trees. The character of the place was thoroughly rural. As a sample of comparative values, it may be mentioned that 25 acres in what is now the most costly part of the city, bounded by Flatbush and Fulton Avenues, were then bought by Mr. Parmentier, a French émigré, for $4,000. Who remembers the old places as they were? Who remembers the old citizens of that time? Among the former were Smith and Woods, Co. Downings, and other public houses at the ferry. The old ferry itself, Love Lane, the heights as then, the wall about with the wooden bridge, and the road out beyond Fulton Street to the old toll gate. Among the latter were the majestic and genial General Jeremiah Johnson, with others, Gabriel Furman, Rev. E. M. Johnson, Alden Spooner, Mr. Pierpont, Mr. Geralaman, Samuel Willoughby, Jonathan Trotter, George Hall, Cyrus P. Smith, N. B. Morse, John Dykeman, Adrian Hedgeman, William Udall, and old Mr. Dufflin with his military garden. End of footnote. Growth, Health, Work I developed 1833, 1834, 5, into a healthy, strong youth. Grew too fast, though, was nearly as big as a man at 15 or 16. Our family at this period moved back to the country. My dear mother very ill for a long time, but recovered. All these years I was down Long Island more or less every summer, now east, now west, sometimes months at a stretch. 
at sixteen, seventeen, and so on, was fond of debating societies, and had an active membership with them off and on in Brooklyn and one or two country towns on the island, a most omnivorous novel reader, these and later years, devoured everything I could get, fond of the theater also in New York, went whenever I could, sometimes witnessing fine performances. 1836-37 worked as compositor in printing offices in New York City, then, when little more than eighteen, and for a while afterwards, went to teaching country schools down in Queens and Suffolk counties, Long Island, and boarded round. This latter I considered one of my best experiences and deepest lessons in human nature beyond the scenes and in the masses. In thirty-nine forty, I started and published a weekly paper in my native town, Huntington, then returned to New York City and Brooklyn, worked on as printer and writer, mostly prose, but an occasional shy at poetry. My passion for fairies. Living in Brooklyn or New York City from this time forward, my life then, and still more the following years, was curiously identified with Fulton Ferry, already becoming the greatest of its sort in the world for general importance, volume, variety, rapidity, and picturesqueness. Almost daily later, 1850 to 1860, I crossed on the boats, often up in the pilot houses where I could get a full sweep, absorbing shows, accompaniments, surroundings, what oceanic currents, eddies underneath, the great tides of humanity also, with ever-shifting movements. Indeed, I have always had a passion for fairies. To me, they afford inimitable, streaming, never-failing, living poems, the river and bay scenery all about New York Island any time of a fine day, the hurrying, splashing sea tides, the changing panorama of steamers, all sizes, often a string of big ones outward bound to distant ports, the myriads of white-sailed schooners, sloops, skiffs, and the marvelously beautiful yachts, the majestic sound boats as they rounded the battery and came along towards five afternoon eastward bound, the prospect off towards Staten Island or down the Narrows, or the other way up the Hudson. What refreshment of spirit such sights and experiences gave me years ago, and many a time since. My old pilot friends, the Balls Sears, Johnny Cole, Ira Smith, William White, and my young fairy friend, Tom Jeer, how well I remember them all. Broadway Sights Besides Fulton Ferry, off and on for years, I knew and frequented Broadway, that noted avenue of New York's crowded and mixed humanity, and of so many notables. Here I saw, during those times, Andrew Jackson, Webster, Clay, Seward, Martin Van Buren, Filibuster Walker, Kosith, Fitz Green Halleck, Bryant, the Prince of Wales, Charles Dickens, the first Japanese ambassadors, and lots of other celebrities of the time. Always something novel or inspiriting, yet mostly to me the hurrying and vast amplitude of those never-ending human currents. I remember seeing James Fenimore Cooper in a courtroom in Chambers Street, back of the city hall where he was carrying on a law case. I think it was a charge of libel he had brought against someone. I also remember seeing Edgar A. Poe, and having a short interview with him. It must have been in 1845 or 6, in his office, second story of a corner building, Duane or Pearl Street. He was editor and owner or part owner of the Broadway Journal. The visit was about a piece of mine he had published. Poe was very cordial in a quiet way, appeared well in person, dress, etc. I have a distinct and pleasing remembrance of his looks, voice, manner, and matter, very kindly and human, but subdued, perhaps a little jaded. For another of my reminiscences, here on the west side, just below Houston Street, I once saw, it must have been around 1832, of a sharp, bright January day, a bent, feeble, but stout-built, very old man, bearded, swathed in rich furs, with a great ermine cap on his head, led and assisted, almost carried, down the steps of his high front stoop, a dozen friends and servants, emulous, carefully holding, guiding him. 
and then lifted and tucked in a gorgeous sleigh, enveloped in other furs, for a ride. The sleigh was drawn by as fine a team of horses as I ever saw. You didn't think all the best animals are brought up nowadays. Never was such horse flesh as fifty years ago on Long Island, or South, or in New York City. Folks looked for spirit and metal in a nag, not tame speed merely. Well, I, a boy of perhaps thirteen or fourteen, stopped and gazed long at the spectacle of that fur-swathed old man, surrounded by friends and servants, and the careful seating of him in the sleigh. I remember the spirited, champing horses, the driver with his whip, and a fellow driver by his side for extra prudence. The old man, the subject of so much attention, I can almost see now, it was John Jacob Astor. The years 1846, 47, and there along see me still in New York City, working as writer and printer, having my usual good health and a good time generally. Omnibus, Jaunts, and Drivers One phase of those days must by no means go unrecorded, namely the Broadway omnibuses with their drivers. The vehicles still, I write this paragraph in 1881, give a portion of the character of Broadway, the Fifth Avenue, Madison Avenue, and 23rd Street lines yet running, but the flush days of the old Broadway stages, characteristic and copious, are over. The Yellow Birds, the Red Birds, the original Broadway, the Fourth Avenue, the Knickerbocker, and a dozen others of twenty or thirty years ago are all gone. And the men, specially identified with them, and giving vitality and meaning to them, the drivers, a strange, natural, quick-eyed, and wondrous race, not only Rabelais and Cervantes would have gloated upon them, but Homer and Shakespeare would. How well I remember them, and must here give a word about them. How many hours, forenoons and afternoons, how many exhilarating night times I have had, perhaps June or July, in cooler air, riding the whole length of Broadway, listening to some yarn, and the most vivid yarns ever spun, and the rarest mimicry. Or perhaps I, declaiming some stormy passage from Julius Caesar or Richard, you could roar as loudly as you chose in that heavy, dense, uninterrupted street base. Yes, I knew all the drivers then. Broadway Jack, Dressmaker, Balky Bill, George Storms, Old Elephant, his brother Young Elephant, who came afterward, Tippy, Pop Bryce, Big Frank, Yellow Joe, Pete Callahan, Patsy D., and dozens more, for there were hundreds. They had immense qualities, largely animal, eating, drinking, women, great personal pride in their way, perhaps a few slouches here and there, but I should have trusted the general run of them in their simple good will and honor under all circumstances. Not only for comradeship and sometimes affection, great studies I found them also. I suppose the critics will laugh heartily, but the influence of those Broadway omnibus jaunts and drivers and declamations and escapades undoubtedly entered into the gestation of leaves of grass. Plays and Operas too. And certain actors and singers had a good deal to do with the business. All through these years, off and on, I frequented the Old Park, the Bowery, Broadway, and Chatham Square theaters and the Italian operas at Chambers Street, Astor Place, or the Battery. Many seasons was on the free list, writing for papers, even as quite a youth. The Old Park Theater, what names, reminiscences, the words bring back. Placide, Clark, Mrs. Vernon, Fisher, Clara F., Mrs. Wood, Mrs. Sequin, Ellen Tree, Hackett, the Younger Keene, McCready, Mrs. Richardson, Rice, Singers, tragedians, comedians, what perfect acting! Henry Placide in Napoleon's Old Guard, or Grandfather Whitehead, or the provoked husband of Gibber, with Fanny Kemble as Lady Townley, or Sheridan Knowles in his own Virginius, or inimitable power in Born to Good Luck, these and many more the years of youth and onward. 
Fanny Kemble, named to conjure up great mimic scenes withal, perhaps the greatest. I remember well her rendering of Bianca in Fazio and Mariana in The Wife. Nothing finer did ever stage exhibit. The veterans of all nations said so, and my boyish heart and head felt it in every minute cell. The lady was just matured, strong, better than merely beautiful, born from the footlights, had had three years' practice in London and through the British towns, and then she came to give America that young maturity and roseate power in all their noon, or rather forenoon, flush. It was my good luck to see her nearly every night she played at the old park, certainly in all her principal characters. I heard these years well rendered all the Italian and other operas in vogue, Sonambula, the Puritans, their Freischutz, Huguenots, Fille du Regiment, Faust, Etoile du Nord, Poliotu, and others, Verdi's Ernani, Rigoletto, and Trovatore, with Donizetti's Lucia, or Favorita, or Lucrezia, and Obe's Massaniello, or Rossini's William Tell, and Gazzaladra, were among my special enjoyments. I heard Alboni every time she sang in New York and vicinity, also Greasy, the tenor Mario, and the baritone Bariali, the finest in the world. This musical passion followed my theatrical one. As a boy or young man I had seen, reading them carefully the day beforehand, quite all Shakespeare's acting dramas, played wonderfully well. Even yet I cannot conceive anything finer than the old booth in Richard the Third or Lear, I don't know which was best, or Iago, or Pescara, or Sir Giles Overreach, to go outside of Shakespeare, or Tom Hamblin in Macbeth, or Old Clark, either as the ghost in Hamlet, or as Prospero in The Tempest, with Mrs. Austin as Ariel, and Peter Richings as Caliban. Then other dramas and fine players in them, Forrest as Metamora, or Damon, or Brutus, John R. Scott as Tom Kringle or Rolla, or Charlotte Cushman's Lady Gay Spanker in London Assurance. Then, of some years later, at Castle Garden Battery, I yet recall the splendid seasons of the Havana musical troupe under Maretzek. The fine band, the cool sea breezes, the unsurpassed vocalism. Stefanon, Bocio, Truffi, Marini in Marino Faliero, Don Pasquale or Favorita, no better playing or singing ever in New York. It was here, too, that I afterward heard Jenny Lind. The battery, its past associations, what tales those old trees and walks and sea walls could tell. Through Eight Years In 1848-49 I was occupied as editor of the Daily Eagle newspaper in Brooklyn. The latter year went off on a leisurely journey and working expedition, my brother Jeff with me, through all the middle states and down the Ohio and Mississippi rivers. Lived a while in New Orleans and worked there on the editorial staff of Daily Crescent newspaper. After a time plodded back northward up the Mississippi and around to and by way of the Great Lakes, Michigan, Huron, and Erie, to Niagara Falls and Lower Canada, finally returning through central New York and down the Hudson, traveling altogether probably 8,000 miles this trip, to and fro. 1851-53 occupied in house-building in Brooklyn, for a little of the first part of that time in printing a daily and weekly paper, The Freeman. 1855 lost my dear father this year by death, commenced putting leaves of grass to press for good at the job-printing office of my friends the Brothers Rome in Brooklyn, after many manuscript doings and undoings, I had great trouble in leaving out the stock poetical touches, but succeeded at last. I am now, 1856-57, passing through my 37th year. Sources of Character Results, 1860 To sum up the foregoing from the outset, and, of course, far, far more unrecorded, I estimate three leading sources and formative stamps to my own character, now solidified for good or bad, and its subsequent literary and other outgrowth. The maternal nativity stock brought hither from far away Netherlands for one, 
doubtless the best, the subterranean tenacity and central bony structure, obstinacy, willfulness, which I get from my paternal English elements, for another, and the combination of my Long Island birth spot, seashores, childhood scenes, absorptions with teeming Brooklyn and New York, with, I suppose, my experiences afterward in the secession outbreak for the third. For, in 1862, startled by news that my brother George, an officer in the 51st New York Volunteers, had been seriously wounded, first Fredericksburg battle, December 13th, I hurriedly went down to the field of war in Virginia. But I must go back a little. End of chapter 1 Recording by Sue Anderson